this feeling that something was terribly wrong with the world that we live in, but you couldn't figure out just what it was. And you've come to the right place. Secret societies, mystery religions, and the Illuminati have been controlling our reality since the beginning of time. But not anymore, because there is an awakening happening, and you are about to become a part of it. Antiquities, a series of studies in the Bible archaeology and history. I am E. Raymond Capt, biblical archaeologist and research historian. Our Creator has revealed many things to man in many ways. In addition to the written word of the Bible, we learn from creation itself and from the archaeological record of past civilizations. This series is designed to open your understanding to many truths, some of which may be new to you. Allow the Holy Spirit, or Spirit of Truth, and the Word of God to be your guide. This series is narrated by Paul H. Johnson. Daniel's He-Goat The prophecies of Daniel have been a challenge to students of the Bible in every age. Many books have been written with the objective of attempting to clarify the meaning of the visions recorded by the prophet. However, the obscurity which has persisted in surrounding them was also predicted by Daniel, whose instructions were to shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Daniel 12, verse 4. But the instructions to seal the book also included the definite time when those seals would be broken. Until the period specified in the instructions arrived, much of what Daniel predicted regarding the end of the age was to remain closed to even the most diligent student of prophecy. Until that time, it would be impossible for men to fully understand the magnitude of Daniel's utterances. The seals are being broken. The long-range predictions of Daniel are having a remarkable and detailed fulfillment in current events of our day. We will now consider one. The book of Daniel records a vision Daniel had. Reading from Daniel chapter 8, verse 3. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river, a ram which had two horns, and the horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher horn came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward, and northward, and southward, so that now beasts might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will, and became great." The interpretation of this vision given to Daniel is found in verse 20 that the ram is the Medo-Persian Empire, with the two horns representing its major kings. The portrayal of the two horns representing the two major aspects of the Medo-Persian Empire is historically accurate, as the Persians coming last and represented by the higher horn were also more prominent and powerful. The directions which represent the conquests of the ram include all except the east. Although Persia did expand to the east, its principal movement was westward towards Babylon, Syria, Greece, and Asia, northward toward the Lydians, Armenians, and Scythians, and southward toward Arabia, Ethiopia, and Egypt. All these nations, the Persian Empire, at one time or another, tried to subdue in order to enlarge their dominion, and at last Persia became so powerful that no beasts, symbolizing kingdoms and nations, could stand before them. It is very significant that the Persian king, when he stood at the head of his army, wore instead of a diadem the head of a ram. The vision continues, reading from verses 5 to 7. And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west of the face of the whole earth, and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, 
and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with collar against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground, and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. The identification of the he-goat is found in chapter 8, verse 21, which reads, And the rough goat is the king of Greece, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. It is well known that the first king of Greece was Alexander the Great, and like Alexander, Daniel's he-goat came from the west, and as we read in verse 5, from the west on the face of the whole earth. Alexander's conquest began in Greece, then moved eastward and covered the entire territory. Alexander was eager for retaliation against the Persians, who had attacked Greece earlier in history, and accordingly he moved with choler against them. That is, in great anger, and butting the ram breaks the ram's two horns, which symbolically refers to the complete disintegration of the Medo-Persian Empire, with the result that the ram had no power to stand before the he-goat. The conquest ends with the he-goat casting the ram to the ground, stamping upon it. All this was fulfilled dramatically in history. In 334 B.C., Alexander invaded towards the east with a formidable army, accompanied by a distinguished retinue of philosophers, writers, and scientists. His first military engagement against the Persians came at the river Granicus, which flows into the Hellespont, the strip of water known as the Dardanelles, joining the Aegean Sea with the Sea of Marmora. Both militarily and psychologically, Alexander gained a decisive victory. The Persian army was not only scattered, but the superiority of the Greek cavalry was demonstrated. This was the beginning of the complete conquest of the entire Persian Empire. City after city in Western Asia began to yield to Alexander without opposition. Pushing on through the Cilician gates, Alexander advanced on the plains of Isis, near the northeastern tip of the Mediterranean Sea. There, in November 333 B.C., he defeated the main Persian army under the personal command of Darius III, who barely escaped with his life. This famous battle changed the course of world history, for it opened up Syria, Palestine, Egypt, and the east as far as India to Greek conquest and the influence of Greek culture. In 1831, in the excavations of ancient Pompeii, a colored glass mosaic commemorating the battle was found, depicting Alexander's spear piercing the body of a nobleman who was protecting Darius as the routed Persians were desperately endeavoring to take Darius from the field of battle. From Isis, Alexander marched south into Syria, Phoenicia, and then Palestine. Cities like Aradus, Byblos, and Sidon surrendered without resistance. Tyre, however, refused to surrender, claiming neutrality in the Greco-Persian conflict, no doubt well aware that they had held off the armies of Nebuchadnezzar during the thirteen-year siege of the old land city of Tyre between 585 and 573 B.C. However, despite this rebuff, Alexander began his siege of the island city that Nebuchadnezzar failed to conquer. It took seven months and an immense amount of work in building a land bridge of cedar logs from Lebanon, plus the debris of the old city of Tyre, which had previously been destroyed by the Babylonians. When the causeway reached the island city, the walls were soon broken through and the city fell. The taking of Tyre greatly increased Alexander's prestige, 
and strikingly completed the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy that the stones, timber, and dust of Tyre would be laid in the water, as in Ezekiel's chapter 26 and verse 12, which reads, And they shall make a spoil of thy riches, and make a prey of thy merchandise, and they shall break down thy walls, and destroy thy pleasant houses, and they shall lay the stones and thy timbers and thy dust in the middle of the water. Ezekiel's prophecy against Tyre starts in chapter 26, verse 3, which reads, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, and will cause many nations to come up against thee, as the sea causes his waves to come up. Verse 7 identifies the first nation to come up against Tyre. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings from the north, with horses, and with chariots, and with horsemen, and with companies, and much people. Ezekiel's prophecy continues on through chapters 26 and 27. Alexander the Great completed the fulfillment of the prophecy regarding Tyre. Following his conquest of Tyre, Alexander continued down the coast of Phoenicia and Palestine, receiving homage in city after city until he encountered the formidable fortress of Gaza in southern Palestine. Lying somewhat inland from the ancient coastal town whose harbor had silted up, the city in Alexander's day was constructed on a foundation more than sixty feet high, with massive walls for defense. This height was beyond the reach of the Greek siege engines and was practically impregnable. Not to be frustrated, Alexander constructed a huge mound twelve hundred feet wide at the base and some two hundred feet high. From this man-made elevation, his siege engines were able to reach and break down the walls of Gaza, and he took the city. The siege lasted two months and yielded rich rewards in the vast quantities of food and supplies and further increased his prestige and consolidated his control of Palestine. With Syria, Phoenicia, and Palestine well under his control, Alexander pushed on into Egypt, occupying Pelusium in the northeastern part of the Nile Delta. From there he went to Memphis in the southern part of the Delta to worship at the shrine of the Apis bull cult, a move calculated to win the goodwill of the Egyptians. In his advance to the northwestern area of the Delta, he selected a site for the city of Alexandria to be founded to perpetuate his fame. Little did he know the wisdom of his choice or visualize the phenomenal growth and importance due to come to this city and its prominent role in the development of Christianity. In the spring of 331 B.C., Alexander left Egypt, retracing his course up the Palestinian and Phoenician coasts to Tyre. From there he advanced up the Orontes Valley to Antioch. After a short rest, he marched his army north, then eastward across the river Euphrates and the Tigris to clash with Darius on the plain of Galgamela. Alexander planned nothing less than to find Darius III and kill or capture him. However, Darius was waiting for him. So far, the Persians had been able to stop this young Macedonian. However, Darius had only once really tried, and that was two years before. Alexander had won then, but it seemed to Darius that was only because the choice of the battlefield had been a poor one for the Persians and also that he had been surprised by the unexpected infantry tactics employed by the Greeks. Alexander's chief weapon and surprise to Darius was the Greek phalanx, a tightly knit long-speared band of soldiers 
trained to march and maneuver with great precision. This phalanx was like a bristling porcupine of spearheads that could break up any army it marched into and was able to resist any that tried to attack it. Cleverly supported by lightly armed troops and cavalry, nothing could defeat it and nothing did in Alexander's lifetime. Darius's chief weapon was numbers. He could call upon the mighty resources of the largest empire in the history of the Western world up to that time, and Alexander's army he considered puny by comparison. At Isis, the difference was minimized by the fact that the battle was fought between the mountains and the sea in a narrow pass where the phalanx could maneuver properly, but where the Persian numbers were too many for the confined space. Here Darius had to leave the scene of the battle hurriedly to avoid being captured. He was determined not to make the same mistake again. Having learned from his spies that Alexander was moving down the Tigris, Darius planned to meet him on a field designed to give his own numbers the best possible chance of victory. He carefully chose a large, flat region, and had the minor uneven places carefully leveled. He wanted absolutely nothing to impede the sweep of his cavalry. He felt they could simply push the opposing cavalry from the field and then chew away at the edges of Alexander's phalanx until it fell apart to be swallowed up piecemeal by his enormous army. Darius did not realize that he was playing into Alexander's hand to a certain extent, for the Macedonian phalanx worked best on an absolutely level ground. The place Darius chose was near a village named Galgamela, just 18 miles northeast of the ruins of the old city of Nineveh that had lain for three centuries dead and deserted. Later Greek historians said that Alexander's army numbered 40,000 footmen and 7,000 cavalry, and it is believed these numbers had been very near the truth. The Persian army, the same historians insisted, was made up of one million men and 40,000 cavalry. This is ridiculously exaggerated, for it is doubtful if an army of that size could have been properly provisioned or directed in battle. It could only have fought as an armed but mindless mob. Nevertheless, even if the Persian numbers were deflated as much as it is likely to have been, it is certain they still would have outnumbered Alexander's force. The battle would have been the most remarkable David and Goliath affair in the history of warfare. However, all things being equal, the Persians would have won, but the leadership was quite uneven. The great disproportion in the leadership between the two armies would have given the victory to the army of Alexander. When the battle opened on October the 1st, 331 B.C., the Persian line far overlapped the Macedonian, both the left and right flanks. One would have supposed it could have just folded in on both sides to swallow up Alexander's small force but he had so placed his men to enable them to turn and fight any flanking movement. Besides, Alexander had one concealed weapon in mind, and until he had the chance to use it to its fullest advantage, he was content to stay on the defensive. But Darius also had a secret weapon, chariots. When the sway of the battle began edging Alexander's forces off the section of carefully flattened ground, Darius became apprehensive, and lacking the resolution to hold his hand until the right moment, used it prematurely. His secret weapon consisted of chariots. Their use had been discontinued for centuries ever since the Medes abandoned them and climbed onto the backs of their large war horses, which were previously harnessed to the chariots. Darius's chariots, however, had something new added. They were equipped with sharp knives emerging wickedly from the chariot's wheel hubs on either side. These revolving knives on the racing chariot's wheel, impelled with all the fury of the charging horses, would neatly slice off the legs of any men they encountered. 
it was not so much the actual number of men so sliced as it was the absolute confusion into which the enemy would be thrown, it was hoped, as they panicked at the sight of those deadly knives or desperately trying to avoid the stroke when being overtaken. Darius sent a hundred chariots charging toward the Macedonians, but Alexander was not caught unaware. His archers let fly a volley of arrows on the charioteers as they raced across the open land toward the Macedonians, and the soldiers themselves moved neatly to one side or the other to let the chariots pass through, which were then attacked on both flanks. The crucial danger of panic never materialized, and the charge was a complete failure. Now it was time for Alexander to make his move, and it was a simple one. He remembered Darius fleeing at Isis, and he knew he was dealing with a coward. His phalanx was in place, and it began to move remorselessly forward like an animated forest of spears, precisely for the spot in the center of the enemy line where Darius was cowering. Darius held out as long as he dared, but that was not long. When he saw the phalanx bearing down on him, he turned and dashed off the field as fast as his horse could carry him. As at Isis, Alexander's forces overwhelmed the obsolete Persian army. Once again, Darius was put to ignominious flight, only to be stabbed to death a short while later by a treacherous attendant. The decisive battle at Gogamela made Alexander complete master of Persia. Now he could move on to Babylon, where he found no resistance. The people of Babylon welcomed him as their protector. Alexander adopted Cyrus's policy with respect to the ways of those he had conquered. He allowed them liberty, and was only too glad to go through whatever rituals would make them happy. He ordered all their temples to be rebuilt that Xerxes had destroyed over a century before. Unfortunately for Babylon, Alexander could not remain to see his order carried out. He had to seize and consolidate his empire. Leaving viceroys behind, he marched on to Susa, then to Persepolis, where he set fire to the palace of the Persian kings with his own hand in revenge for the burning of Athens in the days of Xerxes' great expedition to Greece a century and a half before. His ardor for conquest led Alexander further eastward to cross the river Indus into the frontier of India. He planned to continue across India, but now finally his troops rebelled. They had had enough of fighting, and Alexander was forced to turn back, arriving in Babylon in 323 B.C. There he decided to make the city his capital. His dream was to rule over a united mankind. He desired to be more than king of the Macedonians or general of the Greeks. He tried to enforce a kind of brotherhood of man. He made his Macedonians take Persian wives and adopt Persian modes of dress and behavior. He invited Persians or any other nationality to join his army. The Macedonians were unhappy and grumbled about this turn of events. What was the use of conquering, they thought, if they did not end up as masters, ignoring the fact that to be master was merely to invite the subject people to strive some day to be masters in their turn, and thus to continue turn and turnabout forever. Alexander may have considered his forced return to Babylon only a temporary setback in his plans of conquering all the lands that flanked the Persian Gulf. Babylon fitted into his plans. It was neither Greek nor Persian, and it was midway between the two extremes of his empire. Babylon lay 1,500 miles from his western boundary and 1,500 miles from the eastern. It also lay conveniently close to the Persian Gulf. Worn down by the grueling marches and immoderate drinking, 
the great conqueror fell sick with fever and died an untimely death at the age of 33 in 323 B.C., at the zenith of his career. Alexander's unexpected death, while still a young man, ruined his life's work in a moment. He had no feasible relative to serve as his successor. There was only a Persian wife, an unborn child, and a half-wit brother. The logical choice would have to be a general, one of those who had been associated with Alexander in his conquests. His generals were many and equally strong. None could seize control from all the others, and none were willing to give way peaceably. The generals held a council in Babylon after Alexander's death to decide on the future of the empire. Failure to come to an agreement precipitated a struggle for power that led to bitter fighting and assassinations that lasted about twenty years before the kingdom was successfully divided as follows. 1. Cassander assumed the rule of Macedonia and Greece. 2. Lysimachus took control of Thrace, Bithynia, and most of Asia Minor. 3. Ptolemy established rule over Egypt and possibly Palestine and Arabia. 4. Seleucus took rule over Syria and the lands to the east, including Babylon. 5. A fifth contender for political power, Antigonus, who earlier had seized Syria, was defeated by Seleucus, leaving the kingdom divided into four divisions. This was as Daniel had foretold. Reading from Daniel chapter 8 and verse 8, There the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and from it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. The interpretation, which is found in verse 22, reads, Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand out of the nation, but not in his power. In fact, his generals murdered his wife and only legitimate son and divided the empire between themselves. The biblical account of Daniel's prophecy regarding the he-goat was written in the 6th century B.C. and was fulfilled by Alexander two centuries later in the 4th century B.C. The clear message is that we can rely on the Bible record. It is not the work of fallible man. It is not a book of ancient fables. It is truly the infallible word of God. The story of Daniel's he-goat shows that God not only knows the end from the beginning and has predicted the future, but that he also sees to it that the prophecies are fulfilled. As we study the ancient history of the biblical kingdoms revealed by archaeology, we see unfolded before our eyes, step by step, verse by verse, the fulfillment of prophecy, prophecy written 2,000 years earlier, in advance, for us to read today. Can anyone honestly doubt that our Bible was inspired by the Almighty God and that Daniel was truly a prophet of God? I hope you have enjoyed this study in Biblical Antiquities, covering archaeological research in the Bible lands that has led to a proper understanding of the biblical text and historical